we're Chip and Joanna Gaines. Look how strong he is. Oh, we take the worst house in the best neighborhood and we turn it into our client's dream home. Are you guys ready to see your house? <gasps> oh. oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Do you have the guts to take on a fixer-upper? Well, good afternoon, everyone. For those um, who are new here or you're visiting, guest uh, with us, uh, my name is uh, Robert Kelly. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we're really glad uh, that you've joined us today. We're glad that all of you are here for the continuation of our series called Fixer Upper. I've been watching the show a little bit lately. I, in fact, when we first kind of came up with this idea that it'd be a great Easter series tie-in for what really goes on in the soul, uh, I had actually never seen an episode of it before. And so I started watching it because I'm like, well, I got to figure out like, you know, some references and at least know who the stars are. And then I watched a few more episodes and then a few more episodes. And now I'm going to watch every single episode. And I booked my flight to Waco to go to visit Magnolia. And no, I didn't actually, but I want to because it really is such a, uh, an enjoyable show. And I think in part it reminded me of our own house project that we had done some years ago. And uh, there was uh, a guy who was uh, on the job site a lot, like every day for months on end. And so he was a big part of uh, the, the work and our lives at the time. And, and every day he would say, you know, well, if I don't get started, I'm never going to finish. And at first I was like, then get started, like get moving. And then, of course, hearing it every day, well, you know, if I don't get started, I'm never going to finish. It really started to sink in such that probably once a week now, we'll be sitting down, I'll be having a cup of coffee, and I'll, you know, look at Cheryl, and I'll be like, well, if I don't get started, I'm never going to finish. Like, you know, it, and it really does fit with my personality. If something needs to be done, if some problem needs to be solved, or if some hill needs to be taken, great, let's get at it. Let's get going. Let's get moving. Let's do it. Let's take care of business. We've got to get started. And I think I watched the show because in, in some ways with Chip and Joanna, you know, in, in one episode, you get to go from which house should we buy all the way through design and demo and all the hard work that goes into it into boom, finished product. Just like that. You're like, yes, look, they did work. They got it finished. There was, must have been lots of tasks that were done in order to get them to that. And so that brings some sort of joy of completion into my soul. It's also why I loved the book of Nehemiah. I've always loved it because to me, I see ne Nehemiah like this. In my, in my head, you know, that's him in the middle with the bucket and the sword. And it's like, you know, here's Nehemiah. He's, he's carrying on the work and he's got a sword to fight off all the bad guys who are going to try to get in their way. And, you know, he's there uh, surrounded by this cacophony of, of, of noises and, and people, you know, trying to do their part of it. And he's telling this group to do that and this group to do that. And he's organizing everyone and they're getting the job done. I love that idea. It feels so good. I mean, in a few short chapters, we find him boldly asking the king for the sun, moon, and stars to help him finish the project. And then he sets off on this arduous journey all the way to Jerusalem, inspects the walls, and then pow, the walls are up. Like, this is, this is some serious action going on here. Really love it. This time around, I was reading through the book in preparation for this series, couple of times and something else struck me from the book. Something that doesn't quite fit with my personality or my style of leadership. The book is filled with patience and prayer. Great. Great. There are over a dozen prayers in this relatively small book, some short, some long, and they indicate that the whole of the story was bathed in patient and hopeful and trusting prayer. This is discouraging to me. I find it discouraging because I have always had an on-again, off-again relationship with prayer. I know some of you are like, oh my goodness, the pastor just said he doesn't pray. Don't get me wrong, all right? I wouldn't, I, I, it's not that I don't pray. I would say that I pray every day, just like many Americans say that they pray every day. 
According to a Pew Research survey, 2014, more than half, 55% of Americans say they pray every day. Barna Research says that 84% of Americans claim that they prayed in the last week, even among those who were religiously unaffiliated. 20% say they pray daily. This is, you know, this is some pretty interesting numbers, especially considering we're Americans. Then I just got, I got to thinking, you know, it, that's neat about the kind of Americans in general. If only we knew how Beacon felt about prayer. And then I remembered the survey that we took. We do know what Beacon thinks about, feels about, and does with prayer. We actually do know some of these numbers. So here's what we got. In our church-wide survey, we found that most everyone prays. 92% say that prayer is a significant part of their spiritual journey. It's like nearly everybody, especially considering there would have been some guests there and people who weren't part of Beacon that morning. 92%, 82% say that they pray almost every day, way higher than national averages, which is what I would have expected, nothing less. All of the other important spiritual markers go up and to the right when prayer goes up and to the right. So it doesn't matter what it was. Anything that we could measure in our survey, what you believe, the amount of time you spend serving, participation in events, whether you're connected to a growth group or not, whether you're sharing your faith, all of those things increase. There's a correlation between all of those things and prayer. 85% of our regular attendees pray almost every day. Then we found out about our covenant members. This was really interesting. Our covenant members, 93% of our covenant members pray almost every day. Then we got to our leaders. 96% of our leaders pray. So I need to talk to the 4% of our <laughs> leaders, <laughs> unless it was me. I should go back and look. But... Um, 96%. They were only, it was only outstripped by one other grouping in the whole church, our discipleship group participants. So if you're in a discipleship group, 97% of those people pray almost every single day. Interestingly, we also had it broken down by ethnicity, which was kind of an interesting thing. So you're like, we actually know which of the ethnicities here at Beacon pray more than the others. Are you guys interested in that kind of information? It doesn't really feel like politically correct, right? Like to be able to talk about stuff like that? All right, so anyway, here we go. Um, <laughs> so Hispanics and Latinos pray the most. Can you believe that? So hola, mi gente. <laughs> Today, forget the, the pasty white Robert. Today, it's Roberto. <laughs> you are my people. You're my people for sure. That's right. You were me bad hombres in the good way. That's, that's good news. Now, the ethnicity that came in dead last. I'm not, not going to do that one. I'm not going to tell you. That's, not, that's messed up. Uh, it does seem like there's lots of prayer going on. In fact, by all accounts, I'm going through all these numbers, and I think to myself, I guess I'm actually the only one at Beacon that wishes my prayer life was better. Then I thought, wait, no, I did find a statistic that said it's not just me, it's actually all pastors. So apparently, only 16% of pastors are very satisfied with their prayer lives. 37% are either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. So at least we know maybe it's only the pastors here at the church that are dissatisfied. But of course, it got me thinking, if we had phrased the question differently, what would we have found? If we had phrased the question, how many of you feel like your prayer life is awesome? I wonder how many we would get. Or how many feel like it's become a little stale? How many wish that their prayer life could be revitalized, could be deepened? I suspect we would have had a number of people saying, while I might pray often, I might even pray for a decent amount of time. I want more. I want more. In studying some of the prayers of Nehemiah may help to kickstart a stalled prayer life 
and it can certainly help deepen a shallow one. Because when you're reading through the book, you start to ask yourself, it seems, you start to recognize, say, it seems like the real work behind the scenes is prayer. Because it's everywhere you go in the book. And I wonder if the real work behind the scenes in our own lives also ought to be prayer. Open, if you would, to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. And we're going to pull a few different examples out, apply some things to our own prayer lives. And the first is that we are supposed to pray in the face of bad news. This is not a particularly genius insight, is it? This might be the easiest and most natural thing that we do, and it's also seen in the book of Nehemiah. When their enemies mocked them in Nehemiah 4.4, he said, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. They cried out to God. When they were being intimidated and they were exhausted from the hard work in Nehemiah 6, they said, they, they, were, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. So going to pray to God in this way, in the face of bad news, makes perfect sense. And when they're being threatened or intimidated, that might be the natural thing to go. But I think for most of us, I think we often will say a quick prayer and then move on. But this wasn't the case for Nehemiah. Look at uh, verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. It says there that he prayed for some days. It wasn't just a couple of quick little prayers. He prayed for a a good number of days and he prayed day and night and he mourned and he fasted and he sat in his pain in the presence of God. And I think when we're sad and we're despairing, that we can and ought to weep and pray. When we experience great loss, the best thing that we can do is mourn and pray. And when we're experiencing frustration and anger, we can fast and pray. When we're alone and we're confused, when we're feeling threatened, the best thing that we can do is to sit in the presence of God and pray. I mean, how deeply do you feel your prayers? Emotionally, how deeply do you feel them? Because I imagine that many of your prayers and most of your prayer time, like mine, is perfunctory. You kind of rattle off a list of things that you're praying for. Maybe even keep a list that's fine. I'm, I'm sure. I'm not. Uh, this ha- this is, that's, that, um, that's a fine part. It's a normal part of a prayer life. I'm not saying anything about that. But what about bringing our real heartache and our real hurt and our real trouble and our real grief and our real pain before a powerful and loving God? And that takes time. It takes time. And that's something most of us don't want to give to prayer. Now, sometimes I go away for a study retreat and I'm committed to spending a certain amount of the time, a good portion of the time in prayer. So it might be two days or three days, a couple nights, and I just set aside this time and I always bring a book or five and my computer and I end up just cranking out the work with very little prayer. I literally went there to pray, to sit in God's presence. And I just can't. I got to go do something. I got to get moving. I got to accomplish things. And those of us who like to achieve lots of things and fix lots of things, when we see a problem, we immediately start offering solutions. Oh, you're hurting? Okay, do this. Take this. Go see the doctor. Change your life in this way. Because praying 
doesn't seem to do anything. It's not meeting any need. And I suspect that if we were telling that to Nehemiah right now, he'd be saying, are you kidding me? I am doing something. I am meeting a need. I'm meeting the need. We can also pray when you need direction. Pray when you need direction. I think this is also pretty second nature to us. So when you don't know what your next step is going to be, natural thing for Christ followers is to pray. And that's good. Prayer can help you figure out what needs to be fixed. In the TV show, every once in a while, Chip and Joanna will come up against something they don't understand. It's out of their kind of expertise, central AC or retaining wall or something like that. So they bring in an expert. And in a way, that's how we can treat prayer. You know, we, we, we're in a tough situation. We don't know what we're supposed to do. Go left, go right. What do we do, God? And we just say, God, help me out. You're the expert here. And of course, he is the expert. So this is a good thing. He is the expert. He actually does know which path you're supposed to take. So going to him, praying about it, asking, this is not a bad thing. There have actually been times in my own experience, Cheryl and I, we were trying to figure out, right out of graduate school, trying to figure out where to go. Like, you know, which direction do we head? What church do we go to? What part of the country do we go to? And we, I, I felt like we were going to do this thing, and we were going to, like, we needed to do this and this and this, and it, I, it was all about my work and my action and my achieving. And um, in the midst of our prayer, we came, I, I was reading through the scriptures and something just like grabbed my heart and I realized God actually wants me to wait. He wants me to stop with all of my frenetic running and he wants me to wait, which is horrifying to me. He just wants me to sit back and wait. And we did. And all of a sudden, a couple doors started opening, another door opened, another door opened, and before you know it, we find ourselves called. That's actually how we came to New York 18 years ago. It was that series of events, those moments that confirmed for us where God wanted us to be. He gave us the direction we were seeking, and this is a good thing. Unfortunately, I think many times these prayers are really just an attempt to Christianize plans that we've already made. I think you know what I mean. Like, So for instance, somebody will come to me and they'll say, hey, uh, can you help me figure out what college I'm supposed to go to? Got a lot of students in the church. What college am I supposed to go to? And, um, you know, of course, they're like, you know, it, NYU is great, but, you know, Columbia is great. I just don't know which one God wants me to do. And, and this is, sounds very reasonable, and this could be multiplied by a thousand different questions just like this. And I, and I often want to start by saying, well, all right, first, how do you know you're supposed to go to college? And they're like, well, of course I'm going to college. Well, how, do you, how do you know that? You already prayed that through? You already got your answer from God? Well, no. I mean, everyone goes to college. It's not what we're talking about here. I am going to college. Like, that's a given. Were you not listening? You know, like, you now I'm the idiot. Because, like, you know, because we're, we're not quite getting it. But so, all right, let's just forget that for a minute. Let's assume that you really did already hear from God, that you already put it up for prayer. You already know that you're supposed to be going. Or you figured out how the will of God works in that circumstance. How did... I've heard that it said that there are 4,000 colleges in the U.S. and there are 22,000 colleges worldwide. So tell me, how did we get to the place where you're down to two? What, what was the, the spiritual process we used to do that? Because we could assume we could just continue the same thing. And of course, there was very little spiritual process to get down to the two. Well, we didn't want to do those schools because those aren't the reputation that I want. We didn't do those schools because those aren't the major that I want because the major you want has already been vetted by God. And we, those, you know, things over here that we're supposed to, you know, those don't work because they're too far. They're in the south and I don't want to go down. Or these are not good because they're in cold weather. Uh, and then you get down to the 10 or 15 that you're really excited about and you do your pros and cons list, right? So you bust out your pros and cons. And pro, con, pro, con, pro, con. You get to the bottom. There's a lot of pros. Obviously this one. But now you get to the two that have too many pros, too many matching pros. Now you need God to step in. Do you see the dilemma with this, right? I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray about that. I mean, certainly do. Certainly offer it up to him. But it just starts to feel like, I mean, you can do this with your job as well. Many, many other decisions. It seems like oftentimes we're rushing to solutions and we need God to catch up to us. You know, it's like, God, oh my goodness, you know, don't you understand? I got to make a decision by Friday, man. Help me out here, dude. You know, and when you refer to God as dude, it's a capital D. You can do that, but it's like, it's, it's a royal, like, deity D. Somehow, Nehemiah, 
though he was no doubt chomping at the bit. The Bible tells us that he waited from the month of Kislev to the month of Nisan. I mean, crazy, right? That he could wait that long? Nehemiah 1, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, that's when he first heard about it. And then it says in Nehemiah 2, 1, it was the month of Nisan before he said anything to the, to the king. I mean, I didn't know what that meant because I don't know my Jewish calendar. So I'm reading it. I just go right past it. I'm like, okay, so this happened, this happened. It makes it feel like it, it's a very fast thing. That's like saying I heard about it in, at Christmas and I didn't do anything about it. I didn't talk to the king about it till Easter. It was four months it wasn't so fast. It wasn't like action, bang, bang, bang. Let's keep going. Let's crank this thing out. Four months. Nehemiah seems to have brought his heartache to God and not knowing what to do next, he prayed and he planned for four months before taking any action. When is the last time I brought a, a circumstance in my life before God for four months and waited until I knew what he wanted me to do. Man, I want to tell him, why don't you just get doing something, Nehemiah? Get on with it. Start actually taking action. And I suspect that Nehemiah would say, I am taking action. I am doing the more important work here. What else should I be doing rather than seeking God's perfect plan for my life? Then we can pray when you fail. Pray when you fail. Now, I'm not talking about when you fail like at your job or some deadline or anything like that. I'm talking about when you fail God, when you sin. Pray when you sin. So what did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? Hmm? They hid. They hid. Because that's what we do when we sin. The very first thing that we want to do when we've, when we've violated God's way, when we know we've done something wrong, the very first thing we want to do is go run and hide. You see the dilemma here because that's not God saying, go run and hide, I'm going to smack you around a little bit. That's Satan. It's our enemy saying, go run and hide. Why? Because when you run and hide, the worst parts of us, the brokenness can't ever come to the cross. We want to go and run and hide because that's what the enemy tells us is the right thing to do. God is going to be angry. He's going to smack you around. He's going to punish you for your failures. And all the while, Jesus is saying, remember the cross. If you're not willing to take your brokenness, your sinfulness, your struggling selves before God, they will never see the light of the gospel. You'll keep them packed away where they can still hold sway over your life, where they can continue to grow in power. You keep them all packed away and hidden rather than dragging them out and exposing them to the forgiveness that is ours in Christ. They will grow in power, not get weaker back there. You're not going to starve them out of your life. You need to have them rooted out by the truth of the gospel. This is what Nehemiah says. Look, he says in verse 6, I confess the sins we Israelites included, including that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. That's what we need to do. Bring our full, sinful, struggling selves before God. And then we need to pray for something bigger than ourselves. Pray for something bigger than ourselves. Because now we finally get to the type of prayer that I personally find most motivating. So far, it's been like, really? That's prayer? That's what Nehemiah valued? This one, though, this I like. This works for me. I can get excited about this one. Nehemiah, he heard the news. He repented. He mourned, but then he started planning and praying, and he started praying big. Look at Nehemiah 1.10. 
They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. He's talking about the Israelites living in Jerusalem, his people. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. He's saying, God, listen to me and listen to the people who were praying a like prayer. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. He is about to ask the most powerful man in his world, in that whole entire region for a thousand miles, the most powerful man. He's the cupbearer. He's the steward in the king's castle, in his, in his empire, in, his, in the city of Susa. This is one well-placed guy. And you risk a great deal going before a monarch of that kind of power in the ancient world. And Nehemiah, he's able to ask big because he had been praying big. He's not saying kind of in, in some general way, God, please help my people back there home. You know, help them, help them live a little better. World peace. You know, he's praying specific prayers for real people. And he's been developing through the leading of God a plan that actually has now grabbed his heart. If he had never prayed, would it have ever seized his heart? If he had, if he had decided to, to, you know what, let me just pray about some other things and not focus on the city. Let me just forget about the city and all of its heartache. I mean, he never lived there anyway. He may not have even known. All of his social circle, all the Jews he knew and all the other people he knew, they were here in Susa. But for whatever reason, he began to pray. and He began to let this grip his heart. He was able to ask big because he had been praying big. He was able to accomplish something amazing because he had already prayed amazing prayers to an amazing God. I mean, let's view this thing from another angle. One historian says that King Cyrus first issued the decree that the Jews could return to their land. They had been dispersed throughout the Persian Empire. Cyrus said they can return. Some one million Israelites could have returned. And historians say that maybe 50,000 did. Why? 100 years had passed from the time of King Cyrus to the time of Nehemiah. 100 years. And what had happened in that 100 years? Nothing. Or very little little rebuilding, a little restoration, but the people were still in despair and the city was still in ruins. And they were no closer to accomplishing God's promises for them than they had been a hundred years earlier. Why? Ooh, I like that. I get... <laughs> and I think it's easy for us to say, well, it's because of the opposition. But I think it's because of the apathy and the self-centeredness. Most of the Jewish people did nothing. They didn't return home. They didn't fight for the cause. They didn't try to restore the city. When Nehemiah got there, the people were a wreck. They were still living in all sorts of incredibly sinful and immoral ways. Where were the people trying to restore justice to their city? They didn't come home. They stayed scattered. They refused to leave their comfortable lives and come do the hard work that God was calling them to do. I think it was their apathy and their self-centeredness. And I wonder if it's possible that the same malaise infects us today. How many of our prayers are simply about us and our next thing? Take a stopwatch to it and figure it out. Let's say you pray 10 minutes tomorrow. How much of that prayer time is dedicating, dedicated to you and your problems and your own, your children, your family, your house? How many of them? And how many are dedicated to something bigger than yourself? To a real brokenness in the world that needs the restoration of God and needs the church to stand up and do what only the church can do. We don't pray these kinds of prayers. I think many of us 
We just sort of focus on the stuff we know real close to us, but we don't begin to do the real work of restoration that society needs, that our communities need, that the people all around us need, that our neighborhoods need. We don't pray about those things because we're so wrapped up in our thing. I think of how many people continue to create their own problems, and that's what actually causes the preoccupation, the self-centered prayers. You know, sometimes people will say they're praying for a relationship. Oh, God, please help me in this relationship. I don't know what to do. And it's their main prayer for months and months on end. Oh, help me, God, I need to find a spouse. Help me, God, I need to get rid of this spouse. Help me, God, I, I want to have children. If I don't have grandchildren, I'm not going to have any value. And we pray this over and over and over and over again. And God's like, how do you even know you're supposed to be in that relationship? Why can't you find your delight and satisfaction in me alone? Why do you, you see, we're continually creating a lot of the things that we're continually, continually praying about. And some of these are hard to discern because some of these are decisions that go back weeks, months, or even years. Somebody might be praying, God, I'm so busy at work. Please, God, give me life balance. That's all I want, God, life balance. It's hurting everything. Please help me. I'm not saying that's a bad prayer. I'm just saying, should you even be at that job? Are you praying about leaving that job? Are you praying about scaling down your life? Are you praying about the kinds of things that would fix these systemic problems that we have that are consuming our prayer lives because we can't get out of the me and mind mindset? God, I have no time to do anything for my Christian brothers and sisters. No time to serve at the church. No time to help the poor. Well, what about all of those toys and trinkets and hobbies? Do we see how they've actually now sucked any of the freedom that we would need to do these things out of, our, out of our schedules and out of our lives? Maybe that's where the prayer needs to happen. See, but we, these are some decisions. These go back years. And we may not realize the impact they're having on us today. Deep and fervent prayer can come when we are gripped by the brokenness and the hopelessness of the world around us. We need to pray for those things. We need to find out what the needs are, and we need to commit ourselves to it, because it's only once we've committed ourselves in prayer that God can begin to seize our hearts and drive us to action so that we will one day do the restoration that we need to do. I met with the foster care offices of Nassau County. I met a whole lot of amazing women. They see the need and they are a part of the foster care solution. And it was, it was really moving, very, very neat to do. And I couldn't help but ask myself, where is the church in this? Where is the church in this conversation? Where, where are we? Kids and families in need, where are the Christians? Homelessness and the drug epidemic and gang violence, where is the church? We're so busy praying about our own little things. We're not doing the real work of, the, of, of rebuilding, of restoration, so that the kingdom of God might be experienced more fully and completely here in our county. Think about the spiritual needs. You know, how often we forget about this. We know that, that to reach children and students is one of the most important things that we can be doing. All the statistics tell us how vital it is and every single week we're continuing to close classes. We just simply don't have enough help. We don't have enough people who would, would be able to give enough of their time. That tells me almost no one is praying for this need. It tells me that almost no one has this burning passion in their heart. It means we're just interested in what can take place for mine, not for ours and not for theirs. That's heartbreaking. What about lost people? Only a few percent of Nassau County are considered biblical Christians, people who rely on the grace of God in the cross of Jesus to be saved. That's hundreds of thousands of people who need Jesus. Do we pray for that? Do you pray for the churches to be strengthened? Do you pray for leaders to be raised up? Do you pray that people's hearts would be stirred so that they will go out and fight against injustice? If we are going to see our own souls fixed up and then participate in the great renovation work that Jesus has 
for us to do all around us if we're truly going to bring the love of Jesus to our neighbors, then we're going to need to feel the passion of God deeply and we're going to be, have to be moved to pray for these big, gnarly problems, for the destroyed walls and the torn down cities and the people who are living in despair. We need to pray because the real work is prayer. And if you want to revitalize and deepen your prayer life, we need to give it the time needed to wrestle through the pain, to genuinely seek God. We can add this incredibly powerful discipline of confession, and we can start to pray about things that are bigger than ourselves. And I imagine that if we were to do this, God would release countless Christ followers into his kingdom to bring the restorative work to countless lives. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm asking that you would stir up our hearts in an incredible way toward this end. Help us, Lord, to become the men and the woman, women that we need to become as we submit ourselves to you more fully and completely in prayer. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to see, to trust, to believe that there is a real and a vital and a powerful work that is done in the prayer closet when we are on our knees just seeking your face and asking, Lord, for you to stir up our hearts so that we might do your perfect will in this world. Amen.